I'm Anthony Bardos from IET Berkshire, and um, tonight we're going to be uh, hosting a different talk to the normal sort of IET stuff. Tonight we've got uh, Nikki Dancy giving a talk uh, about gender. Nikki is a regional organizer for the GMB union, and um, GMB, by the way, used to stand for General Municipal and Boilermakers Union. So just for the engineers out there who might like the boilermaking thing. Um, she's a regional organiser and she's a feminist campaigner and um, she's got an interesting talk about gender. So here we go. Over to you, Nikki. Okay, thanks very much, Anthony. Um, yeah, first of all, many thanks to uh, Anthony for inviting me tonight uh, and Natalia um, from the IET. It's a, a great honour to be speaking uh, for the Institute of Engineering and Technology. And um, before we kick off with this talk, I'm going to do a bit of a disclaimer. This, this talk was originally put together uh, for a GMB women's conference. It was the first uh, conference of its type and I, I volunteered to, to do a session on a book which I had read recently, which is Delusions of Gender. Uh, this is what the, 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 the uh, talk is all about, and it's the name of the talk as well. So this fantastic book led me to put together this talk. It's designed to be very, very entry level. This should be absolutely approachable for everybody. I'm not a neuroscientist, as Anthony's told you. I, I was a musician uh, previously, professionally, and uh, now I work for a trade union, so I'm, I'm not a scientist. Uh, the closest I get is my dad was an engineer so uh, that, that's my background um, but I'm an enthusiastic amateur and I think it's a really important topic um, uh, on how gender is constructed and the impact that it has on so many of us women and men and all of our non-binary folks and uh, trans brothers and sisters as well uh, gender is something that encapsulates how society wishes to mold us into certain boxes so I will kick off the talk. Let's hope that everything goes OK now with this. Uh, right. OK, I'm assuming that everybody can see this. I, I'm screen sharing now onto the PowerPoint. Um, is that all OK, Anthony? Yep, yeah, I, just... I, we can see that. Great stuff, thank you. Okay, so delusions of gender, how our minds, our society and neurosexism create difference. And this session is normally run in a, in a room full of people and there are times through this presentation that it's meant to be quite interactive. Uh, normally when I've done this for, for many large groups of, of similar size or, or larger than this, there's a bit of laughing, there's a bit of booing, there's, there's a bit of shouting and, and cheering and things like this. So I've left all of those elements in but obviously I can't see any of you I'm just going to be speaking to a silent screen today I, I just hope that, that that you enjoy it and understand maybe how this uh how this will go down in a room full of people um rather than all of us sitting in our living rooms so this talk is based on an amazing book by a, a world famous uh and very highly renowned neuroscientist called Delia Fine um that when the book first came out it was a bit of a revelation to an awful lot of people because neurosexism is actually very very familiar to all of us whether we know the word or not we certainly understand the concept of it so what is neurosexism? Well, when we first of all think about gender roles and we look at its society, we look at the type of careers that, that men and women uh, work in. This, this was just a quick internet grab um, uh, of a, a, a graphic that, that was online. And I don't think that anybody that's watching this talk is going to be particularly surprised when we look at that. So what we can see, the gender considered more competent. Of course, you've got male in, in blue and pink is, uh, is women. Only two professions, nurses and teachers, are actually considered to be uh, more competent if they're women. All of the rest are men. And certainly when we look at the scientific uh, jobs there, where we're looking at uh, lawyers, scientists uh, and doctors, we, we've got those highly technical jobs. Uh, we are certainly looking at male dominated perceptions. So we're all quite aware of that. Shouldn't be a shock to anybody, but where has it come from and why is this the case? 
So neurosexism is, is the sexist assumption that gender differences that we perceive in character and behavior are actually caused by biological differences in people's brains. We do know that if you ask a group of people, uh, a large enough group of people about their jobs or about their favorite subjects at school or what careers they've gone into, indeed there are gender patterns that we can quite clearly see like the last graphic, but uh, neurosexism is the idea that men and women are fundamentally hardwired differently, that their brains are fundamentally differently constructed at birth. And there are many books that have uh, uh, have been published on this uh, subject. So we've got the awful men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and many others, Simon Baron Cohen, I'll be coming back to him, uh, and so on. You can see these stereotypes broadcast on the on the fronts of these, these titles. So Simon Baron Cohen, just as an example, because he particularly winds me up and he particularly winds up Cordelia Fine in her book as well. Very bright man, um, professor of psychopathology at Cambridge, you know, highly uh, respected person in his field. But this is an example of one of Baron Cohen's most most uh, sort of celebrated books, which is a prime example of neurosexism. So yeah, well, we'll give him a boo here. Normally in the room, you'd have a boo for Simon. And Simon says, the female brain is predominantly built for empathy. The male brain is predominantly hardwired for understanding and building systems. People with the female brain make the most wonderful counsellors, primary school teachers, nurses, carers, therapists, mediators, and so on and so on. So you get the idea immediately uh, as to what is going on within this book when those are a couple of the summary statements. Um, it's really notable, especially to me as a trade union uh, uh, officer, that when we look at that, that list uh, of jobs that the female brain is so say very capable of, not only are they all to do with caring, with nurturing, with teaching children, uh, with, 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 you know, nurse type jobs, but they're also uh, renownedly low paid in, in most cases. So that has a massive impact on women. Um, but Simon Baron Cohen's ideas, they are not new. They are decades, centuries, possibly millennia old. We, we, can, we can look at the roots of uh, patriarchy and neurosexism going all, all the way back to possibly the Roman invasion in, in Britain. But we won't go quite so far back as that today. We'll, we'll look at Thomas Gisborne. 1797, Thomas says, the science of legislation, of jurisprudence, of political economy, the conduct of government in all its executive functions, these and other studies are assigned chiefly to men. These qualities are imparted to the female mind with a more sparing hand. The superiority of the female mind is unrivaled with powers adapted to unbend the brow of the learned, to refresh the overlaboured faculties of the wise, and to diffuse throughout the family circle the enlivening and endearing smile of cheerfulness. Uh, so, so you can picture this, this, uh, this lovely woman unbending the brow of her learned and wise husband uh, and grinning like some kind of inane lunatic at her family. Uh, that, that seems to be uh, the neurosexist idea of women's greatest worth. Boo. <laughs> and so it, a summary of Simon Baron Cohen's book, this came from a philosopher, Neil Levy, and he summed up uh, Baron Cohen's book saying that basically what the book was summarising is that on average, women's intelligence is best employed in putting people at their ease while the men get on with the understanding the world and building and repairing the things we need in it, all very relative to, to engineering, science uh, and the STEM subjects, I'm sure you can see. So going back to these ideas about generalizations that people hold about gender, um, we've got two columns here of, of traits that through multiple studies, through multiple questionnaire surveys, quantitative data and so on, um, the, these types of traits or ideas are associated with one gender or another. So the on the left, the ideal qualifications for someone who serves the needs of others, submissive, domesticity, no 
nurturing language in the arts and low authority really crucially uh, on the other side dominant authoritarian aggressive maths and science high authority no prizes whatsoever for guessing which gender is which and again i doubt that any of that is is any particular surprise uh, for anybody watching the the screen at the moment so this is this is a slightly interactive bit and i can't see any of you i can't hear any of you so i'm just gonna have to hope that you might get into this and play along at home just to demonstrate the the difficulties that all of us have with this I, i'm going to ask you in a second to close your eyes and i'm going to say a word to you it's it's a type of vocation a type of job and i want you to picture a person that your your brain just instantly conjures up when i say this word to you. don't try too hard with this you know don't try to push something that you wouldn't naturally uh, jump to that conclusion it's to to try and demonstrate that many of us are tied into these neurosexist ideas where whether we want to be or not. So close your eyes now and picture a philosopher. Okay, I'm assuming that's enough time. You all got some kind of picture of a philosopher in your head. Now, again, normally what I would do is ask people, please raise your hand if the person that you saw in your mind's eye was a man. My, my hand would go up. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing hands go up. Now, keep your hands up if that man was white. And keep your hands up if that man was quite old and had a beard. And most people, you know, I'm no Darren Brown, but most people um, would, would normally be, be admitting that the person that they saw in their head was indeed a, an older white man with a big beard, something like this guy, or maybe this guy, or if you're a bit sillier, something like this guy. So it, it, it's not that you are a sexist. It's not that, that this is deliberate. I've been a lifelong feminist and I see exactly the same image in my mind because over the whole of my life whenever I've heard the word philosopher most of the time I have had this type of image presented to me at the same time uh, so just to try to break that neurosexist pattern just a tiny bit here is a very different photo here is the collegiate of American uh, black women philosophers so every single one of those women in front of you is a philosopher in their own right just as much as the old white guys with big at the top but I dare say that for, for many of you and certainly when I found that photo it was the first time that I had tried to, to put a significantly different idea uh, about gender and about race and about age into my mind when I when I thought of this issue so moving on to the the first big category a lot of this talk is going to be a whistle stop tour through some experiments that, that cordelia fine and and others in various other places i've grabbed these from how they demonstrate that our choices that our abilities that even our stereotypes about ourselves and our self-perception uh can can be demonstrated uh to to be affected by our environment as opposed to being hardwired into our brain as neurosexists believe so an experiment in france in 2007 uh that they they asked a group of students to rate the truth about various stereotypes of the gender difference in maths and the arts Commonly, we believe that men are far better at the sciences and women, uh, you know, have a tendency towards the arts. So they, they, they were given all these stereotypes to look at. After that, they were then asked to rate their own abilities in those subjects. And then very the, the last thing, this is the fascinating bit, is they had to report the actual factual scores that they'd received in their SATS exams in the previous year. And what the, the researchers found was that girls remembered doing better in their actual SATs than they actually had in the arts. They gave themselves on average a 3% higher score than they got. In mass, they lowered themselves by 3% for that, that subject. For boys, the absolute opposite was true. They upped their, their, their remembered score in maths and gave themselves a similar decrease in the arts. So it shows that just by having that stereotype threat, having the, the stereotypes laid out, being reminded of those stereotypes actually cause people's confidence to vary, whether to, to grow or to wane. 
So another experiment, X 2003. This this question, I'm glad to say in recent years that, that we're not led quite so much into a binary on some forms. Some forms do have other options other than male and female, even if it's simply other or uh, don't wish to say or, or you know, more progressive, uh, you know, questionnaires would, would have uh, more variance on this away from the, the dualistic nature of male and female. But what impact is being asked this question at the beginning of a survey or a test? What impact impact does it have? This was is what X was trying to measure. So two groups of students, the, the students, again, they were asked to rate their mathematical and their verbal abilities. And in the first test group, the first question, the only question at the top of the paper was, are you male or female? The second group was a question about their race. So black, Asian, white, etc. Um, and then all of the students completed a questionnaire about how they rate their own abilities in those subjects and what they found. Those that were asked to define their gender, women upped their verbal skills higher and their math scores lower, exactly the same again. Men rated their maths ability higher, but those asked to define their race or ethnic identity, women actually rated their math skills more highly. Men rated their verbal skills higher and their math scores lower. So just that one question, just one question, just a tick box at the beginning of a questionnaire actually presented measurable scientifically uh, measurable results in terms of our, our stereotypes about ourselves. Um, so this is a massive one. Now, in terms of, of tropes about men and women, there is an idea that women are naturally more empathetic than men. Uh, this is one of the, the areas where, so say, women are the winners. Now, actually measuring empathy is renownedly difficult. People are terrible judges, psychologists have found, of their own empathy level. Uh, and, and you can ask somebody to give themselves a score out of 10 or 100, but th their judgment of themselves is horrific. So Ix came up with an empathy test that was widely peer reviewed and I believe is still held up as one of the, the best tests for empathy. So what happens? Two people turn up. They know they're there for an experiment. They're waiting for it to start. The, the scientist, uh, psychologist comes in, so say, to fetch a light bulb for the projector, as it was in the original. And the, the two people sit there and they were secretly filmed and recorded for six minutes while they chatted, wandered around the room, whatever they chose to do. Um, at the end of the six minutes, the, the, the scientist comes back, explains them what they've done and tells them the experiment is over. And then they, they go into other separate rooms and they play the film clip to each person separately, asking them to stop the film at certain times when they remember thinking about or feeling a, a certain way during a, the conversation with the, the other person in the room or whatever. And after that, they're asked to watch the film again. And each time that their partner stopped the tape and recorded feeling something or thinking something, they are asked to guess what their partner was experiencing. Uh, and this has been shown to be a reasonably good test of whether somebody genuinely is empathetic or not. So. I mean, you, you've got people like good old Baron Cohen and others. Uh, I mean, they would certainly assume that men would not do as well as at ta this task at women. They, they would assume that women are far better. What was the actual outcome of not only X's original, I believe, but, but many other peer reviewed tests? Absolutely no gender difference was found. None at all. So. Moving on, another major trope, men have better spatial awareness than women. This is huge in engineering. I'm sure that most of you know the original IQ test was based, a, it was made by an engineer looking for an apprentice, looking to, to measure engineering skills. Um, we, we put a, a huge amount of, uh, of importance and status on spatial awareness, and it impacts ideas about how well uh, people believe women can drive, do engineering, do all manner of scientific jobs, reading math, uh, maps, understanding graphs and diagrams and so on, all of which very much related to all of the STEM subjects, of course. So this is used to justify more men being represented in STEM courses and careers. Fundamentally, this is uh, we are so say hardwired uh, for men to dominate in those fields. So 
Here's a nice simple mental rotation test. Again, this will be a bit interactive if we were all in a room together. Um, but it's, it's, uh, if I was to, to ask the chat box, maybe if you're able to say whether it's number on the left one, two or three, which is identical to the top one, I'm sure that in, the, in this group, there's going to be lots of people coming up with the, the correct answer that it's number one first on the left. So, um, before, oh, sorry, before a really detailed mental rotation test that, that was an experiment done by Sharps, Price and William, uh, men and women participants were told that good performance in this very difficult mental rotation test was linked with, uh, with success in tasks such as Group A were told carrier-based aviation engineering, nuclear propulsion engineering, undersea approach tactics and navigation. And Group B were told clothing and dress design, interior decoration, creative needlepoint, sewing, knitting and crocheting. And men got far lower scores under the same test when they were given this list, uh, the, the second list here. Um, so really interesting that men can be manipulated and into underperforming just as well as women can. This again, this neurosexism it is constructed for both of the genders, not just not just women. So a massive one. There is an idea that women are no good at maths in general. Who likes maths? Well, here's some incredibly horrible calculus. Don't worry, we're not going to be discussing that. It was just a nice graphic to put on the screen. But top students um, in an experiment at New York City University were given a really hard calculus test. They were great math students so that they could handle that kind of stuff. But at the top of the test, group one, were, were told in no uncertain terms, this test is designed to measure their maths ability to try to understand what makes some people better at maths than others. Now, th this is a deliberate stereotype threat to women. Women are very aware, I believe, that, that there is an idea that they struggle more with maths, that they don't find it as naturally easy as men. Now, the second group had the following words on their identical, very hard calculus test. Despite previous testing on thousands of students, no gender difference was found. So the stereotype that threat there, they've tried to totally remove that. They've tried to make this a non-threatening test for women. So women performed far better in the non-threatening test. And I think it was just worth noting here that Bain women actually outperformed all other participants by 11%, including both groups of men. So removing that stereotype threat, removing those barriers, those traditional things that knock our confidence, uh, really created a, a massive difference in, in how well people performed. So big cheer. Right, moving on then. So we're going to go right back now. We're going to go right back, not only to how does this affect children, but we're going to go back to before any of us are born. So Barbara Rothman did a, a really pivotal uh, piece of research back in the 80s. She interviewed a, a massive group of mothers. I believe there was a, there was over a hundred, so quite a big sort of test uh, group for for interview type uh, studies such as this. And she interviewed them about the movement of their baby. One group knew the sex of their baby. They'd been for a scan. They'd been told the others didn't. So she made sure that she had a, a good test group uh, for each group. And what did she find from that? How much do babies move? Well. The reports of those who didn't know the sex of their child before it was born, there was no measurable pattern based on the gender once those children were actually born and they were able to correlate that evidence together. Um, but those who did know the sex, across the board, the amount of mothers who described the males, the boy children, as more energetic, vigorous and strong, to give example words, was absolutely massive. So it shows that even mothers who have a vested interest in pushing back against sexist ideas, we're, we're caught up in these ideas, whether we wish to be or not. OK, so now we've got to the birth. It's a human being. Now, how do we announce births to the world? Um, and at McGill uh, University, there, there was a, a, a interesting experiment where they looked at 400 random birth announcements in, in local newspapers that people have put in. and 
If it was a boy, first of all, they found that parents of boys were much more likely to actually bother announcing uh, the birth of their child than those who had girls. That's uh, depressing in its own right for, for, for girls, I think. Um, but interestingly as well, those parents were more likely to use the word proud to announce the birth. For those uh, fewer that, that did uh, announce the birth of their girl, um, parents of girls were much more likely to say that they were happy to announce the birth of their daughter. So what we've what we're seeing from that is that we associate concepts such as pride, which often goes with status, which goes with success, which goes with with achievement. Uh, whereas with girls, we're using the word happy, an emotional kind of abstract word but what one that makes us feel good admittedly but certainly we're, we're going back to the emotional rather than the notions of pride of success of achievement um right so we, we our child now has got slightly older 11 month old babies in in this uh really fascinating test there was another one that isn't included in this but there, there's a very famous uh piece of research where a group of mothers were taken into a nursery and children uh babies were, were dressed in the opposite color so boys were put in pink and uh girl babies were put in in blue and the mothers were asked to play with the children uh, appropriately and just go go and play with, with the children entertain them with all of these toys and almost across the board they encouraged the boys to be more physical gave them more toys that encouraged building skills that encouraged spatial awareness uh, and so on this is a similar type of uh, experiment but it's a bit less well known so i thought i'd include this instead now mothers were given an adjustable sloping walkway and what they were asked to do is to, is to change the slope uh, to how steep they thought their baby could make it up the a slope or, or how shallow they felt their baby would would need it to be for them to to crawl up easily and when they they showed that measured the actual crawling abilities of girls and, and boys at that age there's no difference there's no measurable difference whatsoever between the genders but mothers on average underestimated their daughters and overestimated their sons so there we go Right, so moving swiftly on, we've kind of covered the school age, the academia, we're, we're zooming through now, and how does this affect us at home? Bearing in mind that this was made for a women, uh, women's workers co conference in the first place, there have been so many studies such as this one, but this is an example of one done in 2004 within a university, so taking professional uh, women, comparing them to uh, professional men. Um, so what they found was that women would be working for 51 hours uh, looking after their family and home so domestic chores childcare, and so on 51 hours again absolutely equal between the amount of time that they had to spend on domestic labor and work labor and uh, sleeping uh, and eating and so on so that gave them a grand total of 26 minutes of free time per day now when we look at a man's week what we can see with this is that his family and home hours are dramatically decreased. We've gone from 51 down to 32, nearly 20 hours less. Uh, but he, interestingly, is able to put in five hours more at work, uh, which certainly, as, as we know about most bosses, means that, that maybe he is more likely to be in line for that promotion than she is. And that gives him uh, two hours uh, free time per day over four times as much as women. So. That, that's saying that behind every great man is a is a great woman. But what actually is behind every great woman? I mean, I'm worried that actually we've just got a filthy kitchen full of dishes and a small grubby child in need of attention. Uh, but that's a, a sad factor of domestic labour and how it's still shared today. There's been very few improvements on that recently. Um, so let's think about flexible working. Now, somebody has to look after children. Somebody has to do domestic chores. We know that. And we know that some jobs are more flexible than others, certainly. But um, what Deutsch uh, uh, did when, when she was researching this, she found two couples. Excuse my terrible little clip arts here. They're, they're appallingly childish, but I found them a, a little while ago. So you've got a man who's a professor, a woman who's a doctor in the opposite couple. The woman is a professor, the man is a doctor. They have the same jobs, nothing has changed except the gender. So 
surely one of those jobs is genuinely more flexible than the other. Well, what Deutsch found was really interesting. In those interviews, both couples described the woman's job as much more flexible, therefore rationalising that the woman should have primary responsibility for childcare and all of the domestic labour that goes with it. OK, so how does this affect us at work? Well, we certainly know this, don't we? I'm not going to go into the gender pay gap. I, I imagine that everybody on the call knows all about it, but I will look at some other elements of work. So there again, there have been countless versions of this experiment where identical CVs are sent in for jobs. The only thing that's changed is, is the, the name or that there have also been similar experiments done uh, in terms of Muslim names uh, in, in the current climate of Islamophobia and so on. But we're, we're looking at this example here, Dr. Karen Miller, Dr. Keith Miller, identical CVs sent in uh, for this job and uh, it, it wasn't experiment so the job didn't actually exist uh, but the, uh, the the people reviewing the the CVs didn't know that what did they find well these university psychologists who didn't know they were being tested on rated the CVs 45% would give Karen a job uh, but 75% would give Keith a job and uh, that unfortunately, both the men and the women psychologists that that was sent to thought that Keith had better research, teaching and service experience than their poor old Karen. So, there, as I say, countless examples of how it's difficult to get a job in the first place, but and how we're treated once we get to work. But what about if you are not only a woman, but also a mum? Well, in a study, uh, we're, we're, again, a similar kind of study, advertising for a marketing director and a communications company, hirers decided when they looked at various CVs for, from a, a, a large panel that they, they were looking across, um, mothers were rated 10% less competent than non-mothers. Mothers seen as 15% less committed to the workplace. Mothers deemed worthy of 11% less salary and only 47% of mothers were recommended for hire compared to 84% of non-mothers. Absolutely astonishing. So you might quite rightly be thinking, well, you know, being a parent is a really big deal. It takes up a lot of time. You know, surely this impacts dads a little bit. So what about dads? Well, is being a parent a disadvantage to men in a similar way to women? There have been many, many studies that have shown that being a dad has no impact whatsoever in, in terms of this, or in some data, it's actually seen as a benefit. It's seen as a stabilizing influence. So uh, happy Father's Day to all the men out there. Uh, right, so we're, we're coming to the end now. So just to leave you with a, a few conclusions. Some men and indeed some women, I, I should have put on here, consciously or not, don't want the opposite gender to invade their territory. Uh, and so when you hear so, some bloke like this uh, charming, smarmy chappy here with his pipe saying, you gals are so, just so much better than us, it, it, uh, housework and parenting, be sceptical about traditional stereotypes. You know, check yourself out, check others out. Remember that you probably saw the old white man philosopher as well, even though intellectually you're quite aware that the world is much, much less black and white than, the, than your subconscious might bring up. We need to be aware of this issue and try to, to pull people up on their assumptions as well as pulling ourselves up. Another really interesting conclusion in, in Cordelia Fine's book and something that she described, Heinz in, in 2004, um, did a study to actually see what out of all the scientific papers that are done, which ones actually get published in journals or goodness me, if they even make it to the to the broadsheets or the tabloids or, or any other form of sort of mainstream press. Um, what Heinz found is that if there are 20 studies, 19 of which find no gender difference whatsoever but one that finds a gender difference that's the one that's going to get the publicity uh, the mainstream 
just suck this up you know it, it makes for clickbait as it would be at the moment and uh you know the, this is what uh, makes the papers but uh this is obviously where those uninteresting uh you know studies that do show that we are much more similar than we are different go to die and I think this is an important element that we need to recognize that neurosexism exists. We need to understand that we have these biases, that, that we've been born into a society that has not given us any choice. We can see uh, that, that, that we are sort of kind of discriminated against from even before we're born. But of course, the people that are doing that discrimination were also born into the same society. So we've got to, to name these problems. We've got to try to recognize that the these problems exist in our subconscious before we can change it and fundamentally neurosexism it restricts every single one of us it restricts our ability to, to live to our full potential it restricts the ability of children to investigate their own intellect their own aptitudes and fundamentally we're at a point where the world needs heroes and needs saving uh, we we should not be restricting our ability as a species as the human race to actually thrive communally as much as we want to, to have our individual freedoms. So that's pretty much the end of this talk. So I'll uh, I'll close this down if I can find the stop sharing and come back into the room. So I'm hoping Anthony will join me now. Thank you. Well, that was absolutely amazing, Nikki. Thank you very much. That's really, really interesting and, and very enlightening. I have to say I've seen it before and I enjoyed it just as much this time as I did the first time. Thank so you. That was really great. And uh, if you've, if anyone's got any questions, if you would like to put them in the Q&A and um, Nikki will choose the easy ones. Man. <laughs> OK. Right. So Mike asks a question. Was the choice of colours, pink and blue in the gender fields throughout your slides, a deliberate scientific act or just an error? Uh, it, it was actually sarcasm, Mike. It's it's me utterly being sarcastic and taking the mickey uh, out of the fact that we are so often assigned blue and pink. So, yeah, it's just my ironic uh, kind of dig at that. Um, so Leslie's put a question in saying such an interesting talk does unconscious bias training do any good yes yes I mean absolutely this this is unconscious bias training a little bit I hope um it, it unconscious bias has come to the forefront in recent years I think a lot more people are aware of it you've got companies looking into this in terms of their hiring uh strategies trying to make sure that they do encourage diversity that they're not over overlooking brilliant people um, be, because of uh, some of our inbuilt biases on, on gender, on race, on sexuality and so on. Uh, so yes, absolutely. I, I do know that I did some, there's some online testing. I know Harvard um, has got some online testing where you can go and test yourself on all of those categories, not just gender, but also race, sexuality and so on. Uh, and it, it tests your ability to a sign, I believe it's a signing whether you feel positive or negative about a certain correlation of words and how quickly you make that association. So that's really quite interesting. Check out unconscious bias uh, on the Harvard website if you if, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, right, let's zoom down the questions. Uh, da, da, da. What were the main differences seen when comparing married and single men and women? um okay now i can't tell you a scientific answer to that as i say disclaimer i'm not a neuroscientist and i don't have all the questions the, the answers in my head but certainly what i do know when we're looking at domestic labor and we're also looking at health there is a, a really quite worrying correlation uh, that shows that when women be, uh, become involved in, in a relationship, whether they're getting married or they're just living with somebody, their health, their, their literal physical health actually goes down. For men, when they get into a relationship, their health is improved. So that's a, a really worrying statistic. And I believe that hasn't changed in a number of decades. That's still the case across the globe. There, there's that general trend uh, that women are less healthy in in relationships very very sad I hope it's it's certainly not 
not everybody's, I'm sure. Um, and uh, when comparing married and single men and women, yeah, I, I don't know any more particular examples on that, um, but I hope that's that's a little bit to, to answer your question. Um, right, it's, oh my God, there's some great questions here. Bear, bear with me while I skim through and try and find one that I, I might be able to answer. So which gendered assumptions, biases, if any, have changed the most in recent de decades and which have proved most persistent? That's a great question. That, that requires a massive overarching knowledge of, of this subject to, to give you a really accurate answer, but I'll try and think of a few examples. I would say that certainly in recent decades, I mean, if we're looking at it, it, the, the gender pay imbalance, you know, that is well known. It might be hotly contested on the internet amongst uh, good old, old right and incel, uh, you know, groups of people. Uh, but certainly the idea that we can simply pay somebody less because there is a woman, that they are a woman as opposed to a man, I, I hope that that has changed and it is now seen as unacceptable. Um, there has been some small shifts towards the amount of housekeeping, housework and childcare that men do, um, but it's not a lot and it is nowhere near getting to, towards e equality uh, at the moment. So um, I would say that that one is going to be very difficult to get to complete in inequality because of the uh, the nature that most uh, most children are, are born to women, so that that's that's going to be something I think we're going to to find it harder to shift because of that maternity element. Um, trying to think of the other elements through there. Um, well, I'd love your comments actually. I mean, has STEM got any better? I'm guessing that a lot of you are working in STEM subjects. Could you comment back to Alex's question? Have things improved in your industry, in at your college, at your university, where, wherever you might come from? If if you're working in a STEM subject, I'd be really interested to to hear from you. Um. OK, often uh, so H, H says often the challenge of increasing diversity or encouraging more women into STEM is given to the women to fix, resulting in the women having less available time to do their actual jobs. Have you any ideas on how to change this? Well, first of all, join a union. I would say that, but join a union and get organized. Uh, that is a disparity of work. And, and look, it's absolutely right that women have a route into challenging issues that affect women negatively where when you looked at the the trump administration making decisions on abortion for example and you've got a room full of old white republican men deciding what half the population are allowed to do with their own bodies or not certainly we we don't want to give the job the job to men to fix but we certainly as well don't want to uh, have women having these jobs piled onto them with no extra time to do the rest of their work. So joining a union, making sure that you're organized in the workplace and kicking up. Women, women traditionally do not demand as much at work as men. It's why a lot of male industries are much more well organized in terms of the union. It's, it's why a lot of tra traditionally uh, female jobs are, are, are less highly paid. Those workers tend to be working in caring roles where it's much more difficult to walk away at the end of a shift. For example, let's say that you're working in social care and somebody that you're caring for has, has just had a really nasty turn. They're waiting for an ambulance. Are you going to look at your, look at your watch and go, oh, my time's over, I'm off now, I'll, I'll leave you to it? You're not going to do that. Uh, whereas, you know, men working in different fields that have less emotional tug to them uh, tend to, to not be quite so giving to their employers. So uh, that, that would be, be uh, some uh, examples for that. Um, right, let's have a look. Sorry, there's loads of questions. I'm trying to skim through them now. Bear with me a second. Ah, some professions, Nigel, so some professions have been more successful in gender equality, such as the law and medical. Have any studies been done to see how they did it? 
Well, I don't know the answer to your actual question, Nigel. That's a really good question. And I'm sure that somebody has actually looked into that. I'm sure that it's uh, available to find somewhere. But one thing that is really interesting about women and the law, um, what they found, is, I believe this was based in America, but they looked at how women were starting to dominate law courses. And we, we actually got to a tipping point where more professionals are employed in the law were women uh, than men. But what they found is that as the, the percentage of women went up, the pay went down. So lawyers, as it's become a more female dominated trade, the pay for that role has actually sunk in comparison to, to when it was a male dominated trade. So <laughs> trying to find our way out of this quagmire, you know, where even when women win, they start to lose again in, in some other way. That, that was a really interesting study that I remember reading many years ago. So that, that's something uh, uh, to answer your question there. Um, what are your thoughts as to why, so S, S says, what are your thoughts as to why over the last 20 years, despite efforts to increase women in engineering, so few women take up engineering as a career? Um, again, I'd love the women who, I'm hoping there are some women engineers here, I'd like them to speak, they, they know far better than me, um, but I do look after quite a few engineering uh, businesses in terms of the members that I look after within my job. It's, it's very, very difficult to be what you can't see. This is a, a cliche within feminism, but, but for girls looking at a workplace, if you are 16 or you're 18 or you're 21, whatever, whichever point of education you're leaving and you're going into the world of work, if you get yourself a job and on your first day you walk in and you are the only woman in the workplace or you are one what feels very much like a, a minority token group, you might be three women out of 100 or 10 women out of 200 it's it's difficult it is difficult and i think that women in those male dominated arenas you feel more more judged you can be isolated socially uh you can have groups of men complaining that they can't do what they could do in the past i, I remember one example not an engineering firm but this was a garage uh where a woman had become the the first employee there and i, I get a call as her union officer saying look i don't know if i should raise this with the union but i'm just feeling a bit uncomfy they've you know i'm in, i'm in this garage and i go into the back office to make a cup of tea our little canteen and the walls are plastered plastered in porn absolutely plastered in porn and i said yeah yeah no you should challenge that um but when we did go to challenge that the answers back were well we were all blokes we're giving this woman a job you know goodness me do we have to change everything um it can be very very difficult to break in to those environments uh, that, that you don't necessarily feel welcomed into in a myriad different ways. And it, it might not be quite so dramatic as, as having to look at a wall lined in uh, in porn uh, and women's bodies, but certainly, it, you know, the, the examples are many and varied. Um, are there differences in gender stereotyping between cultures and societies? from Mike. Uh, yes, yes, there are. I mean, I, I, I studied history and I, I've read my entire life around history, gender. Um, and what really struck me when I started digging down into the history of gender construction, both for, both for women and for men, is that you can look at the same country or a different country 10 years 20 years apart let alone 100 years apart and the stereotypes that are assigned to men and women by the dominant ideas of the day have swapped and then they've swapped back again and then they've moved over into a different direction completely so we're, we're told that these ideas are, are, are true, that they've been founded in our history and our understanding since time immemorial and we crawled our way out of the primordial swamp. Um, but the absolute opposite is true. One really uh, well-known example of this is the idea that pink is a girl's colour. Um, I'm sure many people on this call know that actually red was seen as a colour of passion and pink was seen as an offshoot of red and pink was a colour 
colour for uh, boys. Um, I believe when will we be talking? The 1800s, probably right the way through to the very early 1900s. Um, I believe that changed over to pink, but uh, being for girls, but it was exactly the opposite. So there, there's so many different gender stereotypes. There are different cultures where men wear makeup and uh, dress themselves up and are seen as the much more uh, adorning gender, uh, ornamental gender, if I can put that in that way. Uh, that yes, that there are so many examples. I'm, I'm struggling to think of more off the top of my head, and I, I can see we're getting towards the, the end of our time. So I'll move on from that. But it's fascinating reading, Mike, if you want to, to look around that. Um, okay. Oh, here's what, right, Anonymous says, do you also find that clothing retailers impose gender with how they separate items into boys and girls clothing? I did challenge the shop assistant why she'd placed the blue Wellington boots, which my daughter chose herself, into the boys area. Um, I was advised that this is something the shop carries out automatically. I'd agree that there are many areas we need to challenge in regards to uh, male and female and male. Thank you very much for, for that comment. Please bear with me. My cat is shouting to get out the door. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Sorry, anyone who could hear a cat meowing at the screen then, that, that was my cat, Buffy. Um, so, yes, I mean, it's not only clothing, I would say. I, I'm horrified when I, I do occasionally walk through the, the toy sections or Toys R Us, the amount that toys are gendered. Um, personally, as a girl, I was, I was not girly. I liked Lego and Meccano and computer games. I'm still a gamer now. I, I never enjoyed dolls. I had some, but I found them boring and plastic headed weirdos. So, you know, I've, I've, I've always kind of not fitted in with those gender roles myself and found it so frustrating that, that people tried to push makeup and dollies uh, and, and teddy bears onto me when I just wanted to, to build things and make things and do stuff. Um, yes, and we're, we're still doing that so much now. Um, I, I think it's really important that when I buy uh, any kind of present for a child in my life, I make sure that I look at that present and think, is would I happily give that present to that, that child if they were of the opposite gender um, or, or no gender? So, yeah, massive, massive problem. And we need to push back against retailers for doing this. Again, it's a lot of subliminal programming on our children as well as ourselves. Um, Right, I, I believe we're getting right to the end, so I'm going to look for one, one oh, a couple more comments actually. Hi, I'm in engineering, uh, Cesara. Thanks for, for writing, Cesara. Number of female students is slowly going up, same at work, but still very, very low. 11% of engineers at work, 15% at the uni course. So there you've got it from the horse's mouth, far better than me. Um, the, this is what uh, one, of, one of our colleagues here and our sisters in engineering is expecting experiencing at the moment in uh, 2021. It seems absolutely bizarre to me that we can build a Hadron Collider and yet still only 11% of engineers are, are women. It's, a, it's an astonishing disparity between our actual intellect and our wisdom. Um, Okay. Oh, Charles says, I'm a STEM ambassador and attempting to address gender imbalance within my sector, software development, and it's a key thing. Sadly, in primary schools, there's little gender imbalance in terms of interest in computer and technology. This seems to develop in secondary and is more pronounced when reaching exam options. Partly, I think, due to the lack of well-known famous role models. Yes, absolutely. This idea that it's difficult to be what you can't see. I'm going to end on a little anecdote because I think it was it was literally the day that I became a feminist and I believe I was about five. I was at infant school and there was a discussion in school with me and a load of boys and some of the girls having a row about who's better, boys or girls, as you do when you're five. Uh, so that this discussion was going on and I, I was I was good at school. I was able to hold my own against the boys and then some mo most of the time. But this discussion came round to um, we, we discussed ourselves. We had a good, nice, fair fight between them. But what we got on to, one of the boys said, well, all the best, famous, clever people, they're men, aren't they? 
and I went, but, but no, um, um, oh God, and my five-year-old self, I didn't have a comeback. Now I've learned that since I went off and learned it then. And my, my parents, fair play to them. My dad encouraged me to be a feminist. He taught me the names of plenty uh, of amazing women in history, amazing women who, who made scientific exam, uh, 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 movements forward and so on. But it was absolutely devastating for five-year-old me to not have a comeback because he was right. I could think of 20, 30 impressive men who were thought to be really clever and good at stuff. And I couldn't think uh, of women to, to add into that argument. It's absolutely crucial that we push forward the idea that women can do anything, can be anything, and that we highlight women in history who've been forgotten and also women today who are not pushed to the front enough so i think my my voice is getting a bit ho hoarse now we're coming up to eight o'clock so i'll uh, i'll hand back to anthony thank you nikki that was what an absolutely fantastic comment to go out on and um we've really enjoyed that it's been absolutely brilliant and fantastic thank you ever so much and Thanks i hope that's, that's okay and i hope that's uh sort of helped a lot of the members of audience to uh look at things a bit differently 